welcome back to the channel. This is the Darklight Emissary, and today's video is going to continue our topic on the iceberg for Warhammer 40k lore, horror, and mysteries. This is part two, so if you have found this first, if you want to see the first few tiers of the iceberg, I'll link at the beginning here for you, as well as put it in the description. It's just the previous video to this one. There is no direct connection that you need to know for the other layers, but Simply, if you want to see this in sequential order, then I recommend going to that one first and then coming back to this one if you want to follow along in the way I'm ordering it at the very least. Before we get started on the video today, I just want to briefly say you can join us on Discord. It's in the description. We'd love to have you there in this building of community that we're doing here on this channel, trying to get something a bit more substantial than just a video out for you guys if you want to be a part of something lore and Warhammer related that... I'm hoping to grow a bit over the long term here. And that is really it. I just would like to invite you for that. And as always, invite you to like and subscribe if you like this content. Comment if you want to discuss it afterwards. And then the very final thing, as always, there will be a scheduled live stream for this Friday where we will continue the Battlefleet Gothic Armada 2 campaign, Necrons. A few of you have been showing up and I appreciate that. Appreciate your time. And we've had fun discussing some deeper lore bits about the end of the horse heresy and just really any Warhammer topic so far. If you're new here, welcome. If you've been supporting me, uh, welcome back, and I appreciate it. And we'll jump straight in here to part two of the iceberg. All right, so first up, we have a pretty good topic. The Legion of the Damned are the betrayed legions on Istvan Three. So this is a theory in general about both the betrayed loyalist legionnaires of the traitor legions and also, you know, for any of, like, wronged or fallen loyalist marines in general, a lot of them are assumed to be the members of the Legion of the Damned. If you are unfamiliar with the Legion of the Damned, they are essentially some kind of warp entity, it seems like, and they're basically black-clad space marines with flames coming off of them and, like, halos of fire, and they essentially look like basically kind of like a version of vengeance incarnate and it would make sense that they could be members of the betrayed legions simply because they seem to be kind of like this symbol of vengeance exerted from the warp itself going along with this there is speculation that like ferris manis leads the legion of the damned and this legion uh, these forces tend to show up in dire need uh, by space marines that are loyal and they will show up, help save them from certain death, and then they will disappear just as quickly. It is important to note here that the Legion of the Damned, no member of them has ever talked. There's never been any verbal confirmation of who or what they are, whether they're actual spirits or just like some kind of automatic, you know, vengeance personification form of like warp energy that aren't truly personalities, but just like, again, like a need for vengeance being satisfied by the literal warp itself, by the parts of the warp that aren't just pure chaos. But I do like the idea of the betrayed legions being members of the Legion of the Damned, for sure. Next we have, who created the map of ancient Terra the Luna Wolves discovered during the Great Crusade? So this is talking about a part of Horus Rising, where I believe it's Loken talking about finding a map in some honeycomb remains of a civilization on some distant world far from Earth. And inside, they find this map, and none of the Marines know what it is. But the Emperor is with them, and he recognizes it as Earth and says it's ancient Earth at that point. I don't think this one really has, I mean, it doesn't have a direct answer, and it doesn't really have theories per se, really. The best guess really is that you know, whatever pilgrims set forth from Earth and ages past brought this map with them as some kind of remembrance of the homeworld, essentially, right? So they probably set it up shop here, and over the decades and millennia, it became a relic of that ancient past and was left here eventually by this civilization. Who exactly created it, I don't think matters. It was probably created on Earth and taken with someone, and that's probably the answer to this. There's not really much more to speculate on this, really. That's really what makes sense here. Next is 
who or what was the false Primarch. This is one I was not familiar with until I went and looked at what people were talking about with this. Essentially, it's talking about something that happened in the 33rd millennium. So, not long after the Horus Heresy, and not long after the Scouring, really, this occurred as an event. Apparently, the event was purged from all Imperial records, as seems to be the case when it's some kind of embarrassing situation, and it seems to have been enacted by the High Lords of Terra. And what they ordered was for five Space Marine chapters to go and attack and systematically destroy 11 other chapters of Adeptus Astartes that were judged as Traitorus Perdetta and also lay waste to their homeworlds. And apparently that was to a conclusion of a 80-year conflict that at the end of that, that's what they chose to enact. And the, the specific event to bring down these 11 chapters was known as the Pentarchy of Blood. This took place in the Segmentum Pacificus region of space, and it was enacted by these five chapters. The Flesh Eaters, the Carcardodons, the Charnel Guard, the Death Eagles, and the Red Talons. And the Red Talons. Now, beyond this, there isn't really much known about this conflict, and everything seems to be, as noted, erased from any knowledge. So, unless they flesh it out, we really don't know what was going on here why it was called the False Primarch War. We don't know if a Primarch was involved or not. There's really speculation for anything here. It could have been any reason why, you know, it could have been someone with the title of Primarch. We just don't know. We also don't know why these 11 traitor or why these 11 chapters turned traitor or if they actually did or if they just simply made the High Lords mad. We really don't know. And the enemy or the Space Marines sent there all seem to be related or tied to the High Lords of Terra, which there are a couple of quote-unquote pet chapters that the High Lords keep for their own bidding, essentially. And most of these chapters are either not known very well or are also kind of pariah chapters like the Carcharodons kind of keep to themselves. And reading about the Flesh Eaters and the Charnel chapter, essentially, like, they just don't seem to get involved in much uh, outside of you know, this organized attack, essentially. I had heard of some of these chapters before looking at this entry, but like the Charnel Guard, I hadn't heard until now, and they seem like a very bizarre chapter that I might elaborate on its own video, because looking at them, they seem fairly interesting and unique for a chapter of Space Marines. So, speculation for this, it was either some kind of, either one of the Traitor Primarchs came back or helped organize this conflict, or a space brain declared themselves as some kind of reincarnated Primarch, maybe, that was Loyalist, and that was enough to push the High Lords to declare them traitors. But, you know, it's all speculation here for this. There's certainly no other information other than really this small entry about them, essentially. Alright, next we have the Gene Stealer Colts on Terra. And there's not much to say about this, really. I guess apparently there's an like ongoing conflict between Adeptus Custodes, Scissors of Silence, and Gene Stealer Colts on Terra, which Gene Stealer Colts are the heralds of the Tyranid Swarm. They infect a population and over time eventually signal the Tyranids when it's, you know, the plants prepared essentially for them to show up. So really this just indicates a threat of Tyranid invasion or one of the high fleets too set their sights on Terra, which was already the case, I think, because of the Astronomicon and the Emperor being there anyway. The Tyranids certainly could detect that kind of power within the warp through their hive connection, and so they probably were going there regardless of Gene Sailors anyways. Next, we have the Ultramarines added one of the missing legions to their ranks. This mostly comes from the first heretic in the Horse Heresy series of books, as well as a short story in the Horse Heresy with Rogal Dorn and Malkador the Sigilite. So, in the first heretic, we have the word bearers shown a vision of the labs of the Primarchs where they were created in the Imperial Dungeon on Terra. Eventually, the word bearers end up close to one of the tanks that holds one of the missing Primarchs in it. It has stenciled on its side the Roman numeral for 
2 or 11. I don't remember which one off the top of my head, but one of those two. And essentially the word bears are like, you know, wood that we could end this embarrassment, this shame before it could even begin, is what they kind of insinuate to whatever situation befell the missing Primarchs. And before the conversation can go too far, one of the word bearers, I believe Argothal himself, uh, he, that was present, says, you know, remember your oaths. We can't talk about, you know, what happened with the lost Primarchs. You know, we're oath to silence on the matter. And, you know, one of the word bearers, though, basically says, you know, around the same time, the Ultramarines had a huge swell in their, you know, numbers for and became the most populous legion at that time, seeming to indicate the Ultramarines didn't get that big simply from having the power and authority over a kingdom as big as Ultramar, that they weren't pulling that many recruits from the worlds is kind of the insinuation here, that some of their population came from elsewhere. The other word bearers kind of give this marine a look kind of like, you know, like what? You're all thinking it. You know, this is a popular rumor essentially that they've kind of, you know, talked about in hush circles apparently. And I believe this is further confirmed by the short story where Malkador is talking with Rogal Dorn about why the two were banished and Rogal Dorn had gotten his memory locked away for why. Malkador released the memory. Rogal Dorn regretted remembering and asked to be, have it sealed away again. And I think it was there insinuated that both Robout and Rogal Dorn took in the legionaries from the two missing Primarchs, that the legions did not suffer the same fates as whatever befell their Primarchs, that the apparently the Marines were okay to continue serving the Imperium, but had to under the auspices of one of the other legions that was still loyal and in the good graces of the Emperor. So a theory with some insinuated fact although never fully confirmed, really, that there's any other gene seed in those legions other than the ones from their progenitors, but there's a good chance this is the case. Next, we have the Rudd are humans from the future. This comes directly from a novel in the Heresy Era with the Iron Warriors and Perturabo. They are prosecuting a war against the Rudd, and essentially the Rudd don't seem to be directly interested in a conflict with the Iron Warriors, but the world that the Iron Warriors find themselves on seems to be what's considered a migration path for the Hrud to go somewhere. And the whole thing with the Hrud is that they basically cause rapid aging in proximity around themselves just by their very nature. So a regular person will be aged to death in like seconds, and then space marines can age thousands of years and end up looking pretty elderly themselves. Perturabo himself also aged possibly a couple centuries, although as a Primarch that didn't have as much of an effect on him, but he did feel a little bit different from that afterwards. And really where this comes from as a theory comes from a Mechanicus member who wanted to study the Hrud, who was with Perturabo, and he put forth the theory that the Hrud seemed to possibly be from the future, and that they could be humans from the future, greatly evolved or changed from that future. And... It should be noted that the migration paths that these Hrud were following on this world seemed to take the Hrud to like a different dimension, that like they were traveling to this world in great numbers to go to a different time space completely, it seems like. So the Hrud seemed to be capable of possibly living in different dimensions or different realities completely, and that their form in our universe might be due to being in our universe at the time. But really, this is a speculation from one character in one book that I know of. And this is apparently from the novel Hammer of Olympia. Now, more likely, the Hrud have some relation to the Eldar, because apparently the Hrud pantheon of gods they worship have very close similarities to the Eldari pantheon of gods as well. An inquisitor named Maturin Raleigh noted that the gods that the Hrud worshipped were a horned hunter, a red-handed figure, a laughing jester, and a hammer-wielding artisan, which does pass similarities with Aldari. So you have, like, Kayla Mencha Kane represented here by the red-handed figure. The laughing jester would obviously be Kagarak. And then the other two are the hunter and smith god for the Aldari. That, on the top of my head, I don't know their names, but that's who it'd be indicating here. 
the, in general, the Harad are interesting, and I would like to know more about them. But I would also like the mystery around them to stay, because a large part of what makes 40k work is the mystery. But anyway. Next is the Alpha Legion involvement in the Rangden Xenocide. So the only real involvement we know of comes from the Alpharius Primark book, where Alpharius chronicles going into this territory during this conflict to find Omegon himself. Alpharius gets a clue as to a being that seems like he's like him. And Omegon has apparently been fighting the Rangdan there on different worlds. And so there's been sightings of, you know, this Primark in that area. Initially, the Alpha Legion shows up to the Dark Angels who were primarily fighting the conflict against the Rangdan. So after they show up to the Dark Angels, the Alpha Legion seems to kind of offer themselves to help in that conflict. Although being the Alpha Legion, it's possible they were already helping from the shadows in this case. They even basically like showed up in pristine looking armor to present themselves to the Dark Angels as if they were a brand new Legion that just showed up and got commissioned and sent to go help in this war. Like there was one of the Terminators of the Legion. They deliberately had them go put on freshly painted armor to depict this. They didn't want them to have any signs that they had any kind of decorations or history to the Legion for whatever reason. And it didn't really seem to indicate why Alpharius wanted to do this particularly or the Alpha Legion itself. But anyway, really the Alpha Legion probably, you know, helped in a more of overt way with the Rangden Xenocide conflict. And it, essentially, you know, a lot of Legions ended up helping with this conflict, I believe, because it was just such a brutal, destructive conflict against the Imperium of Man. And it was probably the most that the Imperium of Man had lost since the Horse Heresy itself. Beyond that, we don't know much about whether or not the Alpha Legion was truly involved with the Xenocides before or after this. It's really only in the Alpharius Primark book that we get any mention of them at all in that area and the time period. Okay, next we have that Mortarion is going to redeem himself. So I think this mostly comes from God Blight and what the Emperor says about Mortarion having a chance to come back to him and that Mortarion could possibly be saved by the Emperor. And I think that Mortarion being confronted by the Emperor after so many years, Mortarion did seem to be suitably shaken by the fact that the Emperor was more than just a corpse sitting on a throne for the last 10,000 years and having that interaction with his long-lost father did seem to have a very profound effect upon Mortarion. Now, how Mortarion would redeem himself, we don't know, because, I mean, ultimately, at the end of the day, we've never seen a demon prince be cleansed and turned back into, like, a mortal form or into their previous self. As far as we know, being turned into a demon prince is a permanent damnation of your soul and your form, but Primarchs could be a bit different, especially if the Emperor turns into some kind of actual god form and his version of warp power can, like, purge them of any of the, you know, chaos energy entangled in their souls now. I suppose that's maybe a possibility, but we have not seen it yet. The Emperor does insinuate something like this, though. Mortarion himself, personality-wise, I mean, he never liked the Emperor nor the Imperium that much, so I don't know why he would have it, a particular change of heart to come back anyway. So I'm not really sure about him wanting to redeem himself or not here in this case. I did see some people mentioning maybe Isha could redeem him or cleanse him somehow. And so he'd be redeemed despite himself, but remains to be seen here in this case. This next one, I could find no actual discussion on, but the Harlequins uplifted the Tau. I don't know who came up with this, whether it was the Iceberg Maker or if it was like one thread on the 40k lore subreddit that I can't find or somewhere else. But if anyone wants to comment on that, I don't understand why the Harlequins would uplift anyone. That doesn't seem to be the behavior of the Harlequins to have that kind of involvement in anything really, other than going between the different factions of the Eldari and kind of keeping, they're kind of the glue that keeps that society together in a, in a sense. 
Harlequins can go to Kamarag and not be molested for the most part. They can go to the Craft Worlds. They're pretty much honored anywhere they go as Serpents of the Laughing God and Eternal Enemies of Chaos and Slanesh. And, I mean, part of that is Harlequins are just some of the best fighters that the Eldari have, and so they're very deadly warriors. So if you're going to go after them, you have to be really ready for that. But beyond being warriors, there's no sign of them or Kegarak, the god they worship, as having any sort of inspiration or desire or track record of uplifting species, guiding species, doing anything like that. Okay, next we have the Emperor employs demons of his own, Sanguinor, Celestine, and other living saints. This is definitely a good possibility that the Emperor is directly making his most faithful servants uh, transcend and become his own version of spirit or warp-infused being. There's nothing directly saying this yet, really, but definitely beings like the Sanguinor and Celestine and other living saints do behave somewhat like demons do, in the sense that they can be defeated, but they come back from death, that sort of thing, and they tend to manifest in areas with enough like warp energy to sustain them like a demon, so they definitely have some of the same markers, but we've never really seen, I don't think any of these saints, say that the Emperor himself, you know, brought them there. They just talk about their faith in the Emperor, causing their power to basically happen, essentially. I would say right now the main difference between these saints and demons of chaos is that there isn't that many saints, not many living saints like this, and there isn't like any baseline demon of the Emperor, really, like the Chaos Gods. So their manifestation is a bit more unique and singular than what the Chaos Gods do. And then like even like the Legion of the Damned doesn't really work like being like, you know, the foot soldiers for like, you know, a population of essentially demons at the behest of the Emperor. These living saints usually show up by themselves and then, you know, are gone after the conflict, typically. Or they get defeated by characters like Karn the Betrayer, who defeated Celestine in a conflict recently in the Indominus era. And, you know, they come back, but they come back alone. And so that's a distinct difference, I would say, here. I think it's possible, but we have precious little information as of now about these living saints and exactly what causes them other than faith. Or how they are particularly chosen to fill that role. Because with like demon princes, we know demon princes are given that position by some kind of, you know, like offering to the god. They do something atrocious enough essentially to be recognized by one of their patron gods. And then, you know, granted, you know, that demon prince them after that fact. I suppose that by heroic battlefield stuff and like true faith in the emperor... The Emperor could recognize that and do something similar, but again, it's very rare compared to, you know, greater demons and demon princes of the Chaos Gods, at least. At least right now. Like, if the God Emperor is still nascent, which he kind of is, it would make sense there would be less of his, I guess, demons or demon princes or greater demons, but that's the only theory I really have on that. All right, next we have... Vulcan can become the greatest threat to humanity. I couldn't really find anything talking about this. I'm not sure what this exactly is saying. The one thing that Vulcan knows is, I guess, he knows about the Talisman of Seven Hammers on the Golden Throne. So if Vulcan decided, I guess, to go against humanity, he could, you know, show up on Terra, be like, I'm still loyalist, and then be like, I need to go talk to my father. And then walk in and activate the talisman and destroy Terra. But other than that, Vulcan has never given a sign of that. If anything, Vulcan has shown he is one of the biggest champions of humanity. And humanity beyond the Imperium, beyond the Emperor. I think Vulcan, most of all, maybe along with like Jagate Khan, would not be sad to see the Imperium fall. And would, you know, be happy to fight for humanity before anything else. Next, we have... Ordo Necros and Ordo Desolatus. True Purpose. 
And, uh, okay, so these are two very small Ordos within the Inquisition. And apparently Ordo Necros only has five members and Ordo Desolatus is made up of one person. So beyond that and beyond an entry, like basically a sentence mentioning they exist, we don't know what they do. I mean, judging by the name, Necros probably has something to do with bringing either someone or something back from the dead. Perhaps the Emperor is a good guess there. If they think he's dead, at least. And then Desolatus sounds kind of like, I don't know, some kind of specialized exterminatus type of thing. Desolation. I'm not sure. But really, there's nothing about these that we know uh, beyond their names. And I've not seen them mentioned except for in this iceberg. That's how niche and small this lore is about these two entities. Next, we have the enslavers. So the enslavers are a species of warp monster or warp beast, warp animal, so to speak. They look like giant squid or octopus type creatures and their claim to fame is they broke into real space in great numbers during the great war in heaven between the Necrons and the Aldari and the Old Ones and all that. They are basically what pushed the Old Ones into final extinction and part of why the Necrons chose to go into hibernation mode. Essentially what a enslaver does is it finds a especially vulnerable psyker and it'll force the first psyker it can possess to open a portal that allows more enslavers to come into the world and then they all feast upon you know, any mortal that they can get their hands on or tentacles on I should say within reach of themselves essentially and so it was kind of considered an enslaver plague there were so many of them in real space for this time period. And this was right at the height of like the, you know, warp turning into the realm of chaos and it being in turmoil, kind of in, you know, in terms in terms of like a allegory, you know, shook the bees' nest so to speak, and the bees happened to be giant squid monsters from the warp essentially. Enslavers seem particularly powerful. There was one that showed up in a short story during the Horse Heresy era that Horus fought along with Jagate Khan and a couple other Primarchs and it was doing some pretty good damage and it was just a single enslaver let alone swarms of the things so it makes sense that despite the Necrons being pretty powerful along with their Catan that they kind of hunkered down and it makes sense that like the Eldari the Orcs and the others found ways to also I guess avoid the enslavers until they had to retreat back into the warp after their food was gone essentially all right, next we have Sanguinius's vision and the Golden Warrior. This seems to be some visions that Sanguinius had about Dante in the future, fighting the Tyranids or being like one of the last people to be fighting, defending the Golden Throne against a whole horde of enemies. It could possibly be something related to the Sanguinor as well, since the Sanguinor is also a Golden Warrior. Dante also wears golden armor, so... Essentially, it seems to be something that Sanguinius envisioned for either of these beings, or maybe both, or it was a twisted vision. Sanguinius wasn't sure about the validity of his visions. Uh, his visions weren't always like 100% accurate, but in this case, it seems to be about one of those two. And that's really all there is to really say about this entry. It seems to be possibly about partially the devastation of Bale that has happened with um, the invasion of the Tyranids attacking the homeworld of the Blood Angels and Dante and the successor chapters of Blood Angels banding together to defend their homeworld. But beyond that, it could have something to do with Terra and like a final stand there as well, like the end ages, so to speak. Next, we have the Khan. Let himself be captured by the Dark Eldar. So this is the Primarch Jagate Khan of the White Scars Legion. Last we saw the Khan, he was chasing a Dark Eldar Archon on a world into a webway portal. After they were essentially raiding the world, the Khan happened to be there, along with some of his white scars, and so Shikatai ran into the portal along with some of his first company. I don't know about all of them. Now, I couldn't really find any discussion on this. I don't know why he would ever let himself be captured by the Jukari. 
He had a very big axe to grind against the Drukhari for raiding worlds. After the Horse Heresy, his kind of pet focus was to basically attack the Drukhari everywhere they showed up in the space that he was protecting. And past him chasing them in the webway, we've never heard of the Khan since. Nothing, no stories in the webway have ever had a sighting of him. Nothing in the Drukhari novels hinted at a Primarch being loose in Kamarag or anything like a Primarch there. So the origins of the Khan and his first brotherhood, which is, I mean, a hundred space marines. We don't know what happened to them yet. I think they're possibly runners up for coming back soonish because everyone loved the Khan during the Horse Heresy. So it's possible he'll come back from being missing pretty quickly too, because Unlike some of the other Primarchs missing, he kind of has one of the simplest disappearances. And so I think he could reappear pretty easily too and matter-of-factly as well. But I don't see any reason why he would be captured by the Drukhari due to any desire of his own other than running into a trap by them. But I don't think he got trapped by the Drukhari either. That's kind of a funny aside or anecdote. I do remember a long forum conversation once on a forum I once was on for Warhammer years ago. And we were talking about Kamarag, and uh, the leader of Kamarag of the Dark Eldar is Vect, and Vect is suitably terrifying on his own. But there was a joke saying that all the Dark Eldar check under their bed for Vect at night, and Vect checks under his bed for Jakatakan at night. And I always thought that was pretty funny, that uh, the Jukari know that this Primarch is loose, and maybe he terrorizes them, and we just don't know it yet. But I want to elaborate and specify that's completely just a joke that I read once and there's no validity to that as a theory or lore at all. Okay, next, top of the next layer of the iceberg here, we have Sanguinius is coming back. No, he is not. He's not allowed to come back. Any of you that want him to come back are absolute freaking heretics and I will die on this hill. Much like Sanguinius died on his hill. To Horus. I... I don't like the idea of any for sure Primarch that's dead or any character that's dead simply just coming back for simply fan services at least. There have been some characters that have come back, but there's been some decent reasoning for why. I believe that the Primarch deaths are distinct and important enough to the overall lore that it cheapens it to have them come back. One of the biggest problems I have with Star Wars as a universe is everyone seems to come back and that fandom seems to always want characters to come back. So there's never really any stakes to it. Warhammer has some stakes with some of its characters. Yeah, there's some problems with plot armor in some characters' cases, but there is still somewhat a risk of death for most of them, I would say. And usually those deaths have consequences in Warhammer. Sanguinius, most of all, had one of the biggest consequences in how it affected his legion and successor chapters into the future. So to simply bring him back, I mean, they're going to have to come up with a really good reason for why he should come back, essentially, in my opinion. But other than visions by Dante of the Primarch and the Sanguinor being maybe some kind of indication, there is no true, true lore that Sanguinius will be back yet. There's maybe some rumors of it, maybe some things tangentially referring to it, but so far, the dead Primarchs that are dead have remained dead, and I honestly... Just personally hope that they do. Next one is Horus did not kill Sanguinius, but the Emperor did. So this has been debunked as of the end and the death part two and three. We witnessed Horus savagely brutalize and defeat Sanguinius in single combat. So this has to do with a theory that before the final books came out that the Emperor finds Sanguinius in the grips of a rage like the Black Rage or otherwise kind of corrupted having defeated Horus somehow, and then Sanguinius is the one that attacked the Emperor and crippled him. And then they made up the whole propaganda to like hide the embarrassment of Sanguinius having hurt his father, but this has all been debunked by the current novels that are out, much to the disappointment of some people, but that is the lore answer right now. Next we have the Yimga monolith and its supposed connection to the missing Primarch. So this comes from the book Clone Lord, having to do with Fabius Bile, and there's just a mention between characters in that book about how Fulgrim mentioned that one of the missing Primarchs had come out to this monolith 
and kind of explored it and why he was out there. You know, what reason he had to be out there is not known. And beyond that, that's the only line really talking about it. We do know that the M. Guy monolith was used during the opening of the Great Rift. It was active trying to help close the rift up, trying to close the Eye of Terror. And there was a battle fought around it by Necrons that were fighting against forces of Korn that were trying to tear it down. And basically it was active during the uh, you know later part of the 13th Black Crusade, the very end of it, during that end conflict that saw Cadia destroyed. So during its activity, there was nothing indicating anything more about the second Primarch or the 11th Primarch being involved with this monolith, other than the fact that their forces did come and explore it at one point. It has been rumored before that one of the Lost Primarchs might have been a very like far explorer type of legion and that maybe they just left and never came back and that's why they're missing. But that's just pure theory. And I don't know if that has any water to this theory or, you know, them mentioning why they were out that far. Maybe that they were out that far because they're explorers. But beyond that, we know nothing on this. Next is the origins of the sloth. So the sloth are a very bizarre species of Xenos race. Essentially imagine a bipedal man type person wearing a robe, but when you look closer, the face is actually a writhing mass of worms and their body essentially is that too. And these beings are kind of like necromancers in a sense. They and they're kind of like recombinators of biology. So they will take, you know, biomatter from their enemies and form them into like flesh, half flesh, half mechanical monstrosities. If you've ever seen the Skaven from Total Warhammer or just Warhammer fantasy in general, some of the monstrosities in that setting look kind of like how they're described uh, for the sloth uh, creations in this universe. And as for their origins, we really don't know. We know they're involved with the Rangden Xenocides way back because they seem to either follow in the wake of the Rangden or they seem to have been masters of the Rangden. And one other thing we do know about them is they still survive to the current era. There's no sign of the Rangden having survived unless they're like a minor Xeno species by a different name now because the Imperium wouldn't know them as a Rangden anymore. Precious few beings know what those were or what they even looked like. The records have been sealed for those conflicts from, you know, millennia ago. So who knows if anyone even knows where those records are. Only literally like the lion and rub out and some of the fallen dark angels would know what the Rangdan even are by sight. So unless that's the case, the sloth somehow survived the purging of the Rangdan empire and they still kind of crop up once in a while in current era but what created them who they are we really don't know much about them other than that we i don't think we've ever seen a world that they come from like what their original world is their original world is probably in one of the lesser known spaces like the veiled region or the halo stars around the rim of the galaxy they could possibly be, be extra galactic but there's no sign of that and that's just my personal theory on a possibility for them but we don't really even know how they travel through space, especially, really. So there's not really much known about this Xeno species. They're very sinister, weird, and we really only see them so far in the Alpha Legion Primarch book, where Alpharius and some of his marines fought them, and they were very dangerous to fight. They only really fought one actual sloth member, and that one member alone challenged a Primarch. So they seem to be fairly deadly, that's for sure. It is noted that they seem to be somewhat close to the Calexus sector or native to it, which that place is a misbegotten cursed area that we talked about recently in a video about the Tyrant Star, the Wandering Tyrant Star area in that area of space. So just add another horrifying thing there. And then there's a region called the Hazaroth Abyss that consists of cursed space and dead stars. So. You know, they could probably, they could possibly be from like dead worlds with no sun anymore, which would make them hard to find, that's for sure. But all speculation, really. All right, next is 
the true purpose of UR-025. So UR-025 is a man of iron that still exists in the current era. UR-25 was basically shown to be interested in Blackstone fortresses and their technology, and apparently had an affinity for the AI governing the one of those structures. Beyond that, we don't really know much about him. It seems like UR-25 has been hiding as a combat robot within the Imperium, kind of hiding his true nature. So, I mean, the motivation for UR-25 could be to try to, I guess, find an STC. Maybe he knows where one is and then try to rebuild the Men of Iron. He could be just trying to go on some kind of personal journey that we are unaware of, but there's really not much about him other than a short story with him in it, really, about him talking a little bit about, like, you know, how disappointed he is with current humanity, essentially, and how superstitious they are. But beyond that, we don't really know much about UR-25 and what his true purpose really could be. Uh, and it would be interesting to kind of find out, I suppose. But we don't really have much to go on with him. Next, we have the Minotaurs. So the Minotaurs are a chapter of Space Marines that is fairly unique. They basically work only at the behest of the High Lords of Terra, and their chapter master is kind of bizarre compared to other chapter masters, or space marines in general for that matter. His name is Asterion Moloch, and he looks like a gigantic gladiator, essentially. Well, not gladiator, more like a Roman centurion with like the full crest on his helmet and like Terminator armor that is shaped like, like a muscled gladiator warrior. And he has a giant shield and a giant spear. He looks very different from most Space Marines in general. Apparently his armor is Tartarus pattern Artificer Terminator armor. And his weapon is a relic weapon known as the Black Spear. And this being, this Chapter Master is bigger than a lot of Space Marines. He is, there's a couple Chapter Masters that are unusually large and he's one of them. Apparently, a lot of his body is cybernetically replaced from the amount of battles he's been in. And unsurprisingly, him and his chapter served in the Badab War against the secessionist chapters that became like the Red Corsairs, the Astro Claws, which became them, and the other, you know, essentially renegade chapters there. The Minotaurs were sent against them because the Minotaurs are strangely loyalist only to really the High Lord of Terra, or the High Lords of Terra, I should say, not one, but several. And such is their binding to that apparatus of the government that there are edicts in place that suppress any information about the chapter, and that includes even the Inquisitors in the Inquisition can't get the information on the background of this chapter. That's how secretive this chapter is, which is up there like the Grey Knights or secrecy, really. They seem to be only used against renegades, or, you know, other enemies that loyal chapters refuse to suppress for some reason. And their gene seed is also suspect. It's possible that it's either traitor gene seed of some kind, or it's considered uh, chimeric, which means that it might be a mix of different gene seeds put together by the High Lord's blessing. And then they hid that fact because... Plenty of forces within the Imperium, including other Space Marine chapters and forces, politically would really have a problem with the High Lords messing with Gene Seed. And then there's one interesting rumor about their Chapter Master that it's possible that the name Asterion Moloch is just the name taken by Chapter Masters that, you know, take over when the next one dies, and simply take on that persona. And that maybe there's some kind of engram that forces a personality memories of the original Asterion on the new Chapter Master, so that they essentially become Moloch again, kind of like a form of reincarnation in a sense, living within a new body, a new candidate that ascends to authority within the chapter. But this is all rumor and conjecture. The Minotaurs and the High Lords surely are not talking and explaining anything at all here. But interestingly enough, you know, like, it's just interesting to see a chapter of Space Marines that is beholden to any specific government 
apparatus within the Imperium other than like the Grey Knights or like the uh, Death Watch for the Ordo Sinos. There are a couple other chapters like the Minotaurs that way, but it's pretty rare. And then one last thing of note that's unusual about this chapter is they do have a large number of dreadnoughts that they use in combat, way more so than other chapters tend to. And they also seem to have a lot of ancient types of frames of dreadnoughts that a lot of chapters don't have any access to. So they probably have some pretty old relic artificer type dreadnought frames that they can use. This is certainly a chapter I'm interested in learning more about. I haven't read any novels with them involved, but they're certainly one of the more mysterious chapters. They don't really deal with subterfuge really though. Their tactics tend to be pretty brutal and just straightforward, but the very nature of them and who they gain orders from is different. And because of that, and because of their implied authority, they tend to not play well with other loyalist chapters either. Next is Sly Marbo is a perpetual and has died several times by now. So Sly is a Catacan devil. He's essentially just a very accomplished soldier. And he's so accomplished that some people think he might be a perpetual and that, you know, he actually dies in the conflicts he's in, but be, he can just come back. So he's seen as invincible because of that. Some people believe he's one of the missing Primarchs. Some people believe he's just, there's all kinds of rumors surrounding Sly. I mean, it's possible he could be a perpetual. I've never really read up much on him. I tend to think that if you look at it from a surface meta level, that he's simply an analog for like Rambo essentially. And that's why he's just so superlative as a warrior, as like a regular soldier, but he dresses and looks a lot like a Rambo type character, like a lot of the Catacan tend to kind of be analogs of in general for like 80s action stars in a sense. Next is what are the Tyranids hiding or protecting on the jungle world of Zyphoria? And so a lot of people seem to think that they are building some kind of psychic beacon to further draw in the Tyranid fleets because in a sense, maybe this is like an ant colony where if you're familiar with ants at all, what they will do is, you know, they're blind. So ants are blind and I believe they're deaf as well. So the way they get around is by primarily feel and like sense. And what they will do is they drop a scent trail wherever they go. And then the more of them that go to a spot, the stronger that scent becomes and so more ants know that something you know food wise is there or something interesting to the colony is likely over there so they all tend to go that direction likewise with the tyranids it's possible that increasing the psychic strength through some kind of beacon that they can create on this world will further pull in more tyranids that might be on the way or maybe like there needs to be more strength of psychic resonance to bring in more tyranids that's pure speculation. This is like a small blurb in a codex, apparently. So really, it's up to us to kind of determine what we think it is. Whether they're turning the entire planet into like a giant mega tyranid, or it's a beacon like I just talked about, or something else completely. All right, next we have, what's up with Lady Melis and the Crystal Heart of Kegarak? So this is a member of the Drukhari. She is a Archon, so she's a top-ranking member of the Drukhari faction of Aldari. And her entire story, kind of short and to the point, is she once entered the webway, but she was first within the inner circle of Vect, who is the main leader of Kamarag. He ends up banishing her to the webway, into like the wastes or what's considered the wilderness of the webway. She runs into a strange being in the realm, in one of those realms, and she is challenged into some kind of contest of wills. She wins. Uh, she would gain some kind of heart artifact. So she wins, and there is a animate blade, and a crystal heart is left behind, and she uses the blade to remove her own heart and replaces it with the crystal heart, and then she 
comes back to Kamarag and rises to power over time there. And probably due to this, she is able to basically predict any traps that Vect sets for rival Archons like herself. And she's just, she's basically able to kind of detect within combat as well, like be one step or two steps ahead of her opponents as a duelist against her enemies, which is using that blade that she got from that uh, fight with whatever it was in the webway. Now, apparently in an earlier codex entry that someone mentioned on the 40k lore subreddit, it's mentioned that she sealed the door to her rooms at one point and it, she was heard laughing with two voices at the same time. So it's assumed that she is somehow some sort of agent now or puppet of Kegarak ultimately and the Harlequins possibly as well. But uh, the motivation of Kegarak to do this, we don't really know. Kegarak could just be doing it to mess with the Jukari, but he kind of seems to be more of a planner than like Zench, who Zench kind of just does things to fool with things. I do believe that Kegarak probably has a purpose for it. We just haven't seen it yet. And that's a fun entry because I had literally never heard of this character before in the 20 plus years diving into the wikis. I have never come across Lady Melis before today, which is fascinating. It just show, goes to show that you can know a lot about this universe and still learn something completely new. And that's one of the several reasons why I absolutely love this entire setting. Next is that the Soliths are the Drukhari's version of Space Marines, which I don't really see anything talking about that with them, but they do seem to be possibly the Liar from the Horse Heresy and exclusively the Fulgrim book, really, where the Emperor's children fought against the Lair species of Xenos, which are essentially sinuous serpentine type enemies that had multiple arms usually and were also a Selaneshi corrupted race. Now, that being said, there's a lot of evidence laid out in a Reddit post about the Sliths being linked to the Lair that I'm not going to get into, but Really, the theory I feel like that should be here is that connection that the Sliths could be liar that are still around, but I'm not going to dive into it here. Essentially, though, I don't understand why they would be considered the Space Marines of the Drukhari because they're used as bodyguards exclusively and they're mercenaries. They don't really have a lot of the same trappings as Space Marines from what I can see. If anything, the closest the Drukhari have to Space Marines has to be the Incubi, or Incubi, uh, the Incubus Warriors. They are really big martial warriors that are basically part of like a kind of a warrior monkish type order that worships uh, a version of Cain, the war god of the Eldar. And they're kind of stoic and martial and proud, you know, like a lot of things to kind of line up with as uh, with the Space Marines, as with the Incubus, typically. Next, we have... The Chaos Gods wanted Horus to lose. This is a emphatic no from me. Uh, as of End in the Death Part 3, the four Chaos Gods are witnesses for that fight with the Emperor versus Horus. And at one point during the fight, I'll, I'll link the full review in right here, but in the full fight, what I explained and what is explained in the book, near the end, Horus relinquishes some of his power at some kind of deception employed by the Emperor, appealing to Horus's will and pride, essentially. And when the Chaos Gods and Horus realize that it's a ploy, they, you know, like, Horus is panicking, trying to pull his power back to himself. But then, when Horus is kind of, like, trying to pull it back, suddenly the Chaos Gods push it back into him at, like, a really high rate. And it was, like, in a panicked way, so, like, the Chaos Gods did not seem like they wanted Horus to fail. If anything, they were just simply being arrogant in what they were allowing Horus to do with the power they gave him. And then when it looked like Horus was going to fail, they panicked and tried to force all the power back into Horus immediately to protect him. And that failed. So, I don't believe the Chaos Gods wanted Horus to lose. It really doesn't make sense with what they how focused they were for the Chaos Gods to be for years on this 
war against humanity, essentially. The Chaos Gods are rarely involved and focused on real space for so many years in a row, so for them to be somewhat united as Chaos Undivided for that long, for the most part, with minimal bickering, means that, you know, they basically put their great game on pause for that amount of time, which maybe isn't much in the warp, but still, it's a lot of focus for beings that essentially like to fight each other more so than even pay attention to real space within the great game itself. So for them to put aside differences and, you know, imbue Horus with so much power only for them to intend for Horus to lose doesn't make much sense as of the third book and the way they reacted to Horus about to fail in, you know, his task to take the Emperor out. Next, we have the Pale Wasting was a flare virus pandemic unleashed upon humanity and other theories. Certainly, um, that first one is very interesting, a flare virus that is unleashed upon humanity. So what people are skinning other people and draping their skins over themselves, like the flares of the Necrons do. I suppose that's a possibility. There's apparently a lot of theory out there that people have about this subject from the pale wasting being like a Xeno species that worships some kind of a noble, you know, old gods type of god that when humanity looks upon the god or upon this race, it like corrupts them to its cause, kind of like chaos does with the chaos god sometimes, or that it's a wasting disease of some kind unleashed that withers away everything in its path or something related to the sloth or Rangden. Uh, what it is, no one certainly knows. It's just reference, really. So, sky's the limit for your theories on this one. There's a lot out there to look at for this. Next, we have The Lion Killed the Lost Primarchs. And this is a great possibility that this is correct. The lion was used to do a lot of very secretive things. I mentioned this earlier that the lion muses in the newest Sons of the Forest book that you send the lion and the dark angels to do things you don't want no one to know about because, you know, the dark angels and the lion, you know, don't need any praise. They're loyal, you know, very quiet professionals, so to speak. And you send Russ to make a spectacle of something, which is why, like, they were sent to go attack, like, the Thousand Suns, and that was far from a secret or expunged to any degree, really. If this happened, we don't know. The lion isn't telling, and there is no evidence for or really against it right now that I know of. Russ likes to say things, but one thing I've learned about Russ is he's actually a lot sneakier than he lets on. Uh, that's one thing that's kind of brought up in several books that sometimes Russ would sit there and have like a look on his face where he's like thinking very deeply and like Loken I think was observing this that you know the whole persona of Viking and boisterous warrior man is definitely an act that Russ puts on but he's actually a fairly uh, sneaky and calculating individual up to the point where like the things he says can be deliberate misinformation like yeah, I'm totally the Emperor's Executioner. He relies on me to go enforce everything, which could just be a cover for what the Lion does in more in secret. Next, kind of related to this a little bit, is the Fallen are Loyalists. And we are getting answers to that as of current era with the Sons of the Forest novel. The Lion has been drawn to and recruited several of the Fallen uh, to his cause, at least exclusively so far within that book. I know there's a bit more to it afterwards and like some of the supplemental material with like the um, Omen novels, not novels, but the Omen like books that, you know, went broadly over the Lion's return and kind of announced it. Um, he ends up, you know, meeting like the regular Dark Angels and stuff. But within the Sons of the Forest book, the only Space Marines he finds are fallen Space Marines and some of them, which he knew well, he knew all of them back during that era. And some of the Fallen are Chaos Corrupted, but a lot of the ones he finds are Loyalists still. Or they're at least trying to just to survive. Um, whether or not they're loyal to the Emperor or Imperium, they don't really express too stiffly, but even the Lion doesn't really talk much about the Emperor or the Imperium much. He's just... 
he just decides to become a protector of humanity since everything's kind of cut off for him to even really coordinate with the wider Imperium as of that book, at least. So this is at least partially true. There are some loyalist fallen, which is great because I tended to like the fallen characters a lot more than Dark Angels characters. The fallen have really cool like black armor scheme from like the old Legion that I really like over like the more green armor of the Dark Angels in the current era. And last but not least for this part two is Legion of the Damned is led by Rogal Dorn. There is absolutely no evidence of this. It is pure theory. And I tend to believe that Dorn is still alive. There is old lore that indicates he died in an explosion in a boarding action during one of the early Black Crusades, but this has been walked back over time to Rogal Dorn is missing that there was maybe an explosion with the ship or something, but there was never a body or indication recovered. It is possible his arm was recovered, so he might have like a replacement arm now if he ever comes back, but like a cybernetic arm of some kind or something, but it's not known whether the fists actually have his arm anymore, like his hand, which was something that he originally had in older lore. So Dorn is currently most likely missing like the other missing Loyalist Primarchs, and my theory, which I could link here for you, is that Rogal Dorn might be involved in the whole King in Yellow stuff going on with the Beckwin trilogy of novels and Dan of Net because Dorn definitely forms some kind of kinship and relationship with uh, Constantine Valder, who is suspected to be the King in Yellow. So it would track that it would be kind of a huge revelation and kind of a fun side reveal for Rogal Dorn to show up, you know, have the characters of those books. Not only find the chief custody, you know, who knew the emperor personally, but also he happens to have helping him one of the lost sons of the emperor himself, Rogal Dorn. So I don't think Dorn is dead. Therefore, he would not be leading the Legion of the Damned, as far as I know. And that's where I'm going to leave this one. That's two more layers of the iceberg done here. So we have three more to go. I'm going to maybe do the rest of the three in a last go on a third part here. And, uh, you know, some of these I've already addressed looking through some of these briefly as we go down. But anyway, that will do it for this part two. So if you like this, as always, please subscribe. If you haven't yet, I would love to have you come back for future videos. There's also a decent backlog of older videos you can check out. Some of them are not quite as good as these later ones where I've gotten my groove but still good information I think for you especially if you're newer to the franchise newer to the universe in general leave a comment if you'd like to discuss anything from the topics today I'd love to discuss with you in the comment section and then also another reminder there will be a live stream this Friday right now it's going to be around 4 p.m Arizona time that just seems to be where a lot of people tend to be active if my analytics are not lying to me so I'm going to try 4 p.m. Friday, and hopefully I'll see some of you tune in there, and we can further discuss either the latest videos or any other lore you just want to chat about while we continue the Necron campaign, which we should be almost over with, and then I plan on trying out Bolt Gun, which is coming to Game Pass soon. So we'll be able to play that, and that should be a fun time as well. And then last but not least, Discord is in the description once again, so if you want to join us on Discord, we are growing that community where we can just chat and, you know, just try to get this as a more cohesive group of people that want to chat about Warhammer and build a community around it. So, as always, I appreciate your time here. I hope you have a great rest of your week, and I will see you in the next video and at the live stream. Have a great day or night wherever you are, and we will see you in the next one.